ambulances versus cars, ambulances versus mass casualty incidents, and ambulances in research, plus we're going to revisit and take a look at heat-related emergencies. If that's what you're looking for, you found it right here on the MedicCast. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the MediCast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of The Medic Cast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, the Pod Medic, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the program this week. We have a lot of good stuff coming up for you, some news articles that are very important, as well as commentary about some of the things I've been seeing going on in the news lately regarding emergency medical services. And all of that will be coming up here in just a sec on this episode. But before I get to that and get on to this week's tip, I do want to remind you that there is a lot of information in addition to what you hear on the show or watch on the show that you can find over at mediccast.com slash blog over at the MedicCast website are links to all the news items I discuss as well as links to additional information and resources or information on and person we're interviewing all over there in links at the Med- MedicCast website in the show notes there and there's a show notes link right at the top of the page so take advantage of that and of course you can also find contact information there we'll have more contact information for you on how to get back in touch with me later on in the show and i do hope you do that because i love to hear back from you so without too much further ado in just a sec we'll get right into the news We'll kick off this week's news with an alarming article that is something we've talked about here on the show, and I think we're going to be talking about it a lot more. Coming out of Utah, it's a story of an ambulance that T-boned a van full of people at an intersection while taking a patient to the hospital, lights and siren. This is one of those things that happens all too frequently, and in this case, it was the fault of the ambulance driver, according to this article, so I guess allegedly the fault of the ambulance driver, but they did say the van had the green light and the ambulance ran their red light on running lights and sirens, which we know does not matter, and hit that van. And it just points out again, folks, that we need to be very aware of what's going on when we're driving that ambulance. They had a stroke patient in the back of the ambulance, and I know that time is of the essence in this situation, but a few seconds one way or another will probably not make that much of a difference with regard to the cost in human life and tragedy and pain and suffering associated with this. And uh, so they've got an eight-year-old girl in critical condition in an induced coma at this time following this, and many other injuries to the other five passengers in the van. The providers and the patient's relative in the ambulance were all suffering injuries, and the patient themselves actually was injured. So there is a lot to be said here for why are we running lights and sirens through intersections at all. Your lights and your sirens do not protect you from going through those intersections if you don't have the right of way. And I will tell you that when I'm driving, I slow down at every intersection. I don't assume that even if I have a green light, I'm going to have uh, somebody notice me and not run their red light. You know, if you've got a patient in the back, the driver is just as much part of that patient care as the provider in the back is. And the the driver of the ambulance should be doing what they need to do to get the patient to the hospital safely. That is our role and our, our need. Not necessarily quickly. And even if we do so quickly, safely is more important. So let's think about this when next, the next time you're back in an ambulance and you're driving, come to an intersection. If you don't have a, a green light, you should be stopping at every in- intersection. Every stop sign, every time you come up to a traffic light, you should be stopping. If you have the green light, I say you should slow down, approach the intersection with caution, and make sure that all traffic is stopping. It just makes sense, and again, Our ultimate goal is getting the patient to the hospital safely. Speed is secondary to that. So let's keep this in mind the next time we're in our units. We're all very aware 
of the things going on with the uh, that happened a couple weeks ago in Aurora, Colorado, of the mass casualty incident that occurred there. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion about mass casualty incidents related to that article. However, um, some of the things that have come out is that there seemed to be a lag in getting ambulances or additional ambulances to the scene and activating all of the mutual aid agreements that would be needed to get the number of ambulances that ultimately would be needed to transport the large number of patients. Um, I look at this article and I think it's probably very alarming to the public, but this is why we call them mass casualty incidents. They are by definition incidents that local authorities cannot handle on their own. And even if we activate a mass casualty situation and start calling for more ambulances, it takes time to start routing those ambulances. And I think there was a, a lag in time for the police to realize exactly how many dozens of casualties they had, people that were gonna need transportation to the hospital one way or the other and getting that information back to dispatch and dispatch understanding that they just didn't have enough where they were. And uh, so some ambulances took up to a half an hour to get there uh, and bring their services to bear. Now I will say this, uh, it seems to me that the most critically injured patients, this is what you do, you triage these patients at these situations, the most critically injured patients were probably transported pretty rapidly. And of course, I'm sure we'll see some sort of after action report on this in one or both of the major EMS journals. And uh, so you, you should look for that. But one of the things that I think is that we need to work very hard at understanding mass casualty and helping our public to understand mass casualty. If we have a situation where there is a severe accident, a severe problem, the initial services on the scene are going to be unable to provide the care that's needed for all of the patients. And it's going to take as long as it takes to travel from the neighboring mutual aid jurisdictions to get their ambulances there. Um, we just don't have enough resources, especially in rural areas uh, and, and, and even in major cities and, and places like Aurora. So you, you see that there is a need to educate our public and have an appropriate recommendation to them of what they should expect from us in certain situations and then hopefully have our public officials back us up on that. But I just wanted to point out the uh, article here. Um, it, it is something that I think won't surprise many of you that there was some delay in getting extra ambulances there. That happens. Um, and really, you should use this incident in Colorado as a way to spur yourself to be reviewing your mass casualty protocols. Uh, what do you do when something like that happens? What is your agency's protocol and guideline for handling mass casualty incidents? And, uh, you know, we should practice these types of things more often, even if it's a sand table exercise or sitting around and having a discussion about it exercise so that when the time comes, it's not something that you did it over a year ago and nobody really remembers who was in charge of what. So take a look at that and uh, keep that in mind as you go through the next few weeks and are thinking about uh, reviewing what you need to review to stay fresh as an EMS professional. Finally, in this week's news is an article about EMS agencies that are being used to continue to guide the research understanding we have of our resuscitation methods in the field with regard to cardiac arrest and cardiac emergencies. And uh, this is just part of that ongoing process. You know, some of you will say oh, it's 2012. The 2010 guideline didn't come out that long ago, and uh, we just started implementing some of that stuff this year. We don't need uh, to be thinking about the next thing. Well, guess what? These guidelines come out every five years for a reason. They come out every five years because ongoing research helps us to define and modify our understanding. And the National Institutes of Health have partnered with several EMS agencies in order to have them provide data and information back regarding their cardiac arrest patients on what is working, what isn't working. Uh, now, of course, to do this, you need an agency that has got their hands well into the current guidelines that they're using progressive protocols that are going to allow them uh, to see what's going on with regard to our current guidelines, right? So um, things like therapeutic hypothermia, uh, 
things like uh, managing uh, the patients appropriately, who is actually dead, who is actually viable to be resuscitated. All of those things are part of those 2010 guidelines that need to be in place firmly understood by the providers in an agency before we can go ahead and have them participate in a study that's looking at what's going to work better for the next round of patients. Um, so we need to really keep that in mind, uh, but it's exciting. We're going to be following up on this. These studies get released over time as they are brought together. The data is brought together and researched, and uh, we're going to see, I think, uh, some interesting things coming along as we start to look forward to the 2015 guidelines. And uh, some of you are probably groaning, but really it's exciting. We are in a time where we are seeing some very major positive change in a way we haven't seen in years in our resuscitation rates. And that means that we can really refine and make changes to help that move along. So I hope that you will be as excited as I am. I'm going to keep an eye on these types of research programs and I will keep you up to date on what it seems like going on out there. So when the new guidelines come out, you won't be as surprised as the guy sitting next to you because you listen to the MedicCast or view the MedicCast. And that's one of the things, um, you know, the new guidelines came out in 2010. They weren't really a huge surprise to me, but I had been reading these articles and really trying to keep up with what the research was saying. So I had some in indications of at least the direction that medical research was pointing to. And uh, then, of course, the committees got together uh, with the American Heart Association and the Emergency Cardiac Care Guidelines, and they sat down and worked with the world medical community to, to define what was going to be changed. Uh, what were they going to do next? What seemed to be working and what didn't seem to be working? How aggressive in changing these protocols should we be? So uh, I think we're going to continue to see change. I don't think we're likely to see monumental change. But uh, these things, these refinements, make us closer and closer to that ultimate 100% um, survivability for a witnessed VFib, VTAC cardiac arrest. Because if we've got AEDs present, and we've got the most advanced guidelines present, and we've got a well-trained bystander community, there's no reason people can't survive cardiac arrest outside of the hospital with uh, pretty good numbers. So I hope you'll keep that in mind. And again, links to all of this is over at the website, over at mediccast.com slash blog. And if you have questions or comments on any of these articles, I welcome them and I hope to hear from you. You can send those in to me by email at podmedic at mac.com. Time now for this week's tip of the week, and we're going to revisit and look at heat-related emergencies. It's uh, the hottest part of the summer here where I am. I'm sure it is probably, for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, the same for you as we get into the hottest part of the summer months. And I thought it would be appropriate to look at heat-related emergencies and strive to understand uh, exactly what's going on with our patients when we run into these environmental problems. So without too much further ado, let's get back in and look at heat-related emergencies. So what are we talking about here as far as heat-related emergencies? What types are we dealing with? Well, we have heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and the final progression of heat stroke. So people uh, progress through these stages. They may progress through them very rapidly so that they don't immediately recognize the problem until it's on them. They, but usually my experience has been that people ignore early signs of relatively minor heat emergencies and let it progress so that they, they don't really pay attention to heat cramps and heat exhaustion and then suddenly they're in the midst of full-blown heat stroke. So let's talk about each of these cases and what they specifically deal with when we see them in the field. Heat cramps, well, heat cramps are a minor form of heat-related emergency. Basically, patients are starting to experience muscle pain, muscle spasms, and general weakness and sweating. Now, one of the things to remember here is that this heat emergency is caused, caused by an increasing level of heat in the body. The body is no longer able to blow off the steam, as it were. They're not able to get rid of the heat. And so the core body temperature rises. And remember that there's a narrow range in which the proteins in our body work well. And when we go outside that range, either too cold or too warm, we begin to have issues dealing and, and functioning appropriately. And this, this uh, homeostasis 
that we're trying to maintain constantly becomes more difficult to maintain. And so we begin to show signs of shock. So we're really looking, if you want to think about our classic signs of shock, we're really looking at a progression of shock from a mild compensated shock to a more severe compensated starting to decompensate shock and then when you get the heat stroke patients are decompensated they are no longer able to even get rid of any heat and we'll see how that progresses so we have the initial problem heat heat cramps and we have muscle pain we have muscle tremors and spasms weakness the patient is sweating we see this early sign of heat stress how do we handle this? Well, if we can recognize somebody in this particular stage, we can help them pretty immediately by cooling them down, hydrating them. Salt replacement is very important. A lot of times the muscle pain and spasms are as a result of electrolyte imbalances, and we can help to uh, alleviate some of that by by rehydrating these patients and in some cases adding electrolytes, um, giving them uh, some kind of a weak salt and sugar solution. Now, we can do that IV as well. Uh, lactated ringers is great for rehydrating patients. Uh, you can also use normal saline. But heat cramps is very minor, and people often will, you know, push through the pain. You know, no pain, no gain. They get out there, they start working in their yard for the first time. They pick a weekend that gets hot. This particular weekend here on the East Coast, it got near 90 degrees both Saturday and today on Sunday. So what are people doing to go out there and work in the yard, and are they taking enough fluids out with them? Are they stopping regularly to take a break? Are they getting into the shade and taking advantage of uh, cooling themselves off when they do get that break. People that are not used to working outside uh, all the time, their bodies aren't used to dealing with this on a regular basis, and so they are not in the best shape to be out there working hard, and they will ignore the early signs of heat problems in muscle cramps and muscle pain. So the heat cramp stage, again, early stages. So what are we looking at next? Well, heat exhaustion. Again, remember I said that we have uh, late compensated shock. Uh, this is where patients are really starting to have issues. They're in shock. They're beginning to show signs of shock. We have tachycardia. We have tachypnea, where their patients are, their hearts are starting to beat faster. They're trying to move blood around the body faster in an effort to get the core temperature blood out to the periphery so that it can be next to the skin, where hopefully it's not as hot. And that may not be the case if it's 98 degrees outside. So again, it's very difficult for the body to cool itself in this situation. They may have red or pale cool moist skin and again this is one of those things well, how do we know they're still compensating? Well they still are able to sweat. When they reach the point when they can no longer sweat and get that moisture out onto their skin where we can have convection and conduction taking the heat away from them, uh, that evaporative cooling that occurs when we sweat, then that patient can't compensate anymore. So when we still see them sweating, we have cool, moist skin. It could be red because we have a lot of the uh, capillaries are wide open. We've got a lot of blood flowing through the skin at the surface to try to cool off the body. Uh, we see that signs. We may start to see that the patients become pale at this point because they're starting to go into shock and we're shunting starting to shunt the blood flow back to uh, the, the core of the system. We may become mottled as those, all those capillary beds opened up. Um, we may see the modeling that occurs in beginning stages of decompensated shock. Patients are going to complain of um, sweating, they're dizzy, they're weak. Uh, nausea and vomiting are not uncommon in these situations. Again, this is shock, right? What happens when the body goes into shock? Non-essential systems are shut down, and that means the GI tract, so that these patients are you know, not getting blood flow to their, their GI organs because we're trying to, again, get the blood flow out to the skin where we can cool off the most effectively. And patients will be complaining of extreme thirst. You know, here's the, here's the key, and you can, again, you want to re reach out to your, your community and reach out to potential patients. Teach a class in the community on heat emergencies. You can do this in 15 minutes and really educate people. But you can tell them, look, if you're working outside and you're thirsty, stop working right? We tell them that. We say, go, go take a five-minute break. It will not impact the amount of work you get done because you'll actually be more effective if you stop, cool off, hydrate yourself, and then go back to work. 
monitor yourself. Your body is telling you something. When, it's, when you're sweating and you're dizzy and you're weak and you're feeling nauseous and you're very thirsty, that is not the time to dig in and try to get that stump out of the ground again. So this is what we need to educate people about. And this is really a, a sign of you know, shock. Patients are beginning to reach that point where they aren't going to be able to compensate anymore. And we need to be prepared to treat these patients. How do we do that? Well, we're going to be treating them with our fluids. We're going to try to cool them off, get the air conditioning on in the back of our units, get their clothing off. Uh, we want to keep a sheet on them. We want to not cool them too quickly. We don't want to go from being a heat-related emergency to a hypothermic patient, but we can monitor them carefully. Oxygen. This is going to be palliative care, but if you've got the ability to give them IVs, get fluids in, and start giving them a drip and get them to the hospital. And we also have heat stroke. This is the final progression here before cardiac arrest. Body, body's core temperatures have gotten very high. We have patients in uh, ex extreme amount of shock at this point. Uh, the body is no longer able to compensate, no longer able to get heat out of the core, and things are starting to shut down. What happens when you heat up proteins? Well, think about an egg. Proteins, when they get heat applied to them, begin to denature. Those chains of proteins begin to lose their form, and then they coil up like a rubber band that you've twisted too many times so that it starts to knot back on itself. Proteins do the same thing when heat's applied to them, and we want to make sure that we're um, taking care of that problem by dealing with the shock that the patients have uh, and recognizing it. So we're going to see these problems. The enzymes in the body are not going to be working very effectively. We have red hot and dry skin, and I want to stress that. They are going to have dry skin. When you have a patient who has been out working in a hot environment or inside working in a hot environment, they are red hot and they aren't sweating, their skin is warm and dry to the touch, that's a dangerous sign. You're going to have rapid shallow breathing, weak rapid and thready pulse. You might start seeing arrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, because they're in late stages of uh, compensated or early decompensated shock. So you're going to start seeing strange arrhythmias showing up. They're going to have out-of-whack potassium and sodium levels, and these are all going to contribute because of the extreme dehydration to uh, rapidly decreasing cardiac status, and we need to be aware that these patients could go into cardiac arrest. This is one of those situations where you're going to have a patient in a cardiac arrest that you're going to know the cause of. You know, we talk about the, the H's and T's. You know, one of those is hyperthermia. If you have a patient in hyperthermia, you need to get them hydrated again. We've got to run fluids in. We've got to support them. We don't want them to go into cardiac arrest. So we need to keep that in mind. So what are we going to do about treatment? Well, again, we talked about treatment of heat exhaustion and stroke. Uh, we need to be cooling them, get their clothing off, get them into the back of an ambulance, get the air conditioning on, cool them down, get fluids going, oxygen move, um, applied to these patients. They are in shock. It's no different than if they were hypovolemic and bleeding out, if they had a cardiogenic shock, if they had a neurogenic shock, we have a problem here and we need to deal with it. So oxygen, IV fluids, treat arrhythmias according to protocol and ACLS guidelines, and these patients need to be transported to the nearest facility. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of the MedicCast. I want to thank all of you for checking out the show this week. Remember, there are links to everything we discussed in this episode including links to all the news items and, of course, links to the additional information you might need to check out with regards to heat-related emergencies. And all that information is available over at the MedicCast website. I do want to remind you, if you aren't watching the video version of the show, when we do these tip segments, we will be including kind of a PowerPoint uh, presentation to uh, help guide you through that. And so it's a great study reference tool, and you can find all that as part of this episode over at MedicCast.tv. But, of course, the main website with all the show notes, links, and everything Thing is at mediccast.com slash blog. If you want to get back in touch with me, you can do so by heading over and catching me by email at podmedic at mac.com. You can also reach me on Facebook or Twitter, and I love to hear from you under the handle podmedic there, so facebook.com slash podmedic or twitter.com slash podmedic. 
And uh, don't forget to uh, catch up with the MedicCast fan page over on Facebook. You know, over 3,000 of you have already clicked the like button over there and become a fan of the page. And I put additional information, links, and things that you can follow up on, let you know when new episodes are released and things like that, all via that fan page. So if you haven't already done so, head over to the MedicCast fan page, click the like button, and become a fan of the MedicCast at facebook.com slash MedicCast. And of course, don't forget to share the information over at the MedicCast. If you've been a fan for a long time, why don't you head over to the MedicCast page, find one of the posts over there, and share it back to your Facebook page so that other folks can find the MedicCast as well. That's it for me. I'm going to be back soon with another episode. I do want to make sure you all know that we are going to be at EM, um, EMS World Expo coming up here in New Orleans at the end of October. So I think it begins on Halloween Day, October 31st. And you can find out more information. Go to emsworldexpo.com and follow up on that. We're going to have the live podcast studio there as well as a social media lounge with free Wi-Fi and a place to charge your devices. So you can come by, sit out in, in the social media lounge, listen to some live shows from the MedicCast, uh, EMS Garage, EMS Educast, and a bunch of other great shows. And relax a little bit while you're touring the exhibit hall floor. And again, thanks to EMS World Expo for having us back in to cover their event. It's a lot of fun, and we're already looking forward to it. So you want to find out more information, go to emsworldexpo.com. That's it for me. I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic. Be back soon. In the meantime, I want to remind all of you to remember scene safety, BSI. <laughs>